Tristan, you've been practicing or what for uh, Salzburg? I have not yet. I was going to set aside time tomorrow night to do so. Have you tried the wet yet? The wet? Yeah. Uh, maybe what? like t- 10 laps total. It looks like the 911 is pretty strong. Yeah. You guys um, are looking good. It's It's got the benefit of uh, the strong grip under acceleration with like, you know, good gearing in first and second. Oh yeah, that the, long gearing. The yeah. Long. So Cheating. It, it'll be pretty good. And it's, it's also pretty good under the brakes, but it'll be a little sketchy going into corners sometimes, especially if there's going to be like traffic. And also I have uh, no idea how the car behaves behind, um, you know, dirty air. Um, I did some testing. I, I don't think I really felt the dirty air, so I think you'll be fine. Looks like the 911s and the Audis will be like about a second faster than everybody else. Yeah, it's wild. Sweet. <laughs> we'll get right into it. So, but, yep. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, cut you off there, but we got into this nice and natural. I am Wardez. I am here with my good friends, Mr. Bayless Tristan, also known as Road Beef on PSN. How you doing, Tristan? I am good. Uh, we have with us a special guest, uh, the the third man, the silent partner, but not so silent, uh, Armin, TRC Stagger Agacan. <laughs> What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to finally have someone attractive on this show, <laughs> besides Tristan. <laughs> and it's, it feels good, man. It's a, this show is really, really going to be a hit with the uh, ladies. So. <laughs> One day. One day soon. <laughs> Just gotta keep trying. Definitely send us a drop us a line if any females are listening to this, and we will post it all over social media. <laughs> nah. Tag my Instagram under the yeah. The tag it. Up. <laughs> How you doing, Armin? It's so good to have you here, man. It's good to Welcome. be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, it's nice to have a chat with the uh, after the season's over. Yes, it's nice to be just kind of casual now. Yeah. Forty races. How many of the races do you think you did oh. personally? Uh, I think I only missed probably four or five, but to be fair, I only did manufacturers, so I didn't spend too much time. I th- smart, I, smart man. Yep. Yeah, so I left uh, uh, the Nations early on once I found out that it's such a slim chance of actually making the cut, and I put all my eggs in one basket, and I just stay focused on manufacturers. Makes sense. Yeah, the wise choice, even. after all. Yeah. <laughs> you had some good competition, man. There's some great drivers. Pelican... Was yeah, good. Pelican uh, stepped up his game throughout the season. I think uh, we've we've been working together a little bit here and there, and, but um, both Pelican and uh, uh, DNA Vice, he also stepped yeah, up his game. So he's cool. He's cool. Mm-hmm. Pretty good to have uh, fast teammates to be able to share some information with and gather some information as well. Totally. That was that was one thing I had in mind. I wanted to ask both of you and myself. So are you ready, Eddie? Uh, yeah, I might be. <laughs> the uh, question is. Like, what keeps you going? And I'm going to, you know, direct it for our humble guest, uh, Armin. <laughs> and and that, what I mean by that is, in, in GT Sport, you know, different people have different motivations for continuing and pushing hard. And, uh, like, what's the thing that, that kind of makes you smile about what you've accomplished with the, with the game? And what kind of is your carrot that you're chasing, so to speak? Uh, you, you know, if you don't have a, the total clear answer on that, it's fine. We can talk it out. So, wh- what do you think? Uh, to to me, it's just it's uh, it it it's it's really a hard question because I think the competitive aspect of it is what keeps me going, and also I just love racing. So it's the most affordable way to get close to what you get from actual racing. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, uh, but of course. Uh, I, I do strive to be one of the best drivers, so that's part of the reason why we spend so many hours practicing and, you know, justifying the fact that we're sitting here playing games for five hours at a time. But uh, otherwise, the world tours are pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> I like to, of course, catch up with some of the competitors out there and, you know, have some fun. But it's really just, I guess it's 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 a hobby of mine, and uh, it it keeps me. Uh, Staying, uh, it keeps me uh, staying off the actual racetrack and spending a ton of money on. <laughs> so it kind of uh, that's that's my answer. But it's really just it's a really hard one to be honest with you. So what you're saying is Gran Turismo helps you pay rent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I haven't touched my my actual car for about a year now, and it's honestly Gran Turismo is a big part of it. 
my race car that is <laughs> what is what your race, race car, car? I have an, well, it's not really a race car, I guess you could say. <laughs> no, I have an older BMW M3. I have a 95 oh. M3 that I spend a, a ton of money on. I love those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I used to – I bought it actually to prepare for GT Academy. And uh, I spent probably three to four times the amount that the car is actually worth on that car. Mm-hmm. And uh, each track day, the, you know, it just keeps getting more and more expensive. So – yeah, that's been set aside, and I've been just focusing on the game. Uh, especially after GT Academy is over, I just figure I don't need any more of that for now. Uh, so I've been just 100% focused on Gran Turismo. It kind of, it does, it does satisfy that need for racing for me at least. I don't know me if too. it's. I would agree for sure. I don't know if it's the same for everybody else, but that's that's how I kind of, uh, yeah, I kind of stay sane that way. <laughs> <laughs> that itch that has to be scratched. That is exactly, yeah, you you put in much better words. <laughs> um, Armand, are you still using your T500 RS? No, so my T500, about midway through uh, season, I believe season two was the last season, right? Or stage, yeah, stage two. So like race number, um, I think it was race number three, we were in Monza, or race number four. Uh, basically what happened is the force feedback was getting softer and softer, and uh, I was I had it cranked up to force feedback 10, and I was still getting nothing, so no real feel for understeer or anything like that. So uh, I I had to uh, go buy a T300, mm. and uh, I've been using that ever since. But yeah, I was using the T500 all the way through out the season from the beginning of the year up until the end of stage two or close mm-hmm. to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, the wheel rim on the 300, is it the same diameter as the 500? Uh, it's It might be just a fraction smaller, but yeah. it's very similar. It's, it's hardly noticeable. Okay. It's it's actually um, similar to the TGT, so if that kind of gives it you does an help. idea. It yep. totally does. Thank you. But that wheelbase is way bigger on the T500, <laughs> that's it, for sure. It is, and, and uh, the, the shifter paddles don't move with the steering wheel. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, middle of the corner, you're trying to grab an upshift. You have to, re- you know, take your hand off the wheel and grab that upshift. Mm-hmm. Um, I prefer to keep my hands on the wheel, and that's just a <laughs> small thing, but it makes a difference. So especially if you're downshifting as you're turning in, so you have to remove your left hand off the wheel. It, it was just, for me, it was, it was just not making sense to use that wheel anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's t- I don't know why that's even a thing. I mean, they say that's a rally style right system <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah uh the the reason why some manufacturers or some uh racing teams justify that is that you always know where the paddle is even though if you're moving your shifting your hands on the steering wheel so like um like for example porsche will always an audi as well will always keep the paddle shifters at nine o'clock and three o'clock so they're attached to the steering wheel and even if you turn the wheel you always know exactly where to find them unless you move your hands off that position so Ferrari and Lamborghini and other manufacturers will keep the paddle shifter stationary. So if you're shifting your hands in the middle of a drift, for example, uh, you know exactly where to find the upshift or the downshift, which I find to be pretty useless, personally. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. I'm of a contrary opinion, but I think it's important to note that um, Porsche, for example, uh, retain a center console shifter as well as the paddles, whereas Ferrari, Lamborghini do not. They use buttons instead. Right, right, up until the 992, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you both are involved with Porsche in your own ways, which is really cool. Uh, Armin, you do the Porsche Driving Experience School, uh, Academy Experience, <laughs> Amazingness <laughs> Center. <laughs> yeah, the Porsche uh, Experience Center in Los Angeles. Yeah. It's badass, man. It's pretty cool. I got lucky with it, and uh, it was actually due to Gran Turismo that I even have a job there. So, oh, nice, um, nice. Yeah, uh, it goes back to 2013 with GT Academy. Um, in preparation, I met some really cool people at the racetrack, and eventually just kind of snowballed into this big thing where I started working in the industry, and now I'm a well, I was a full-time driving instructor, and now I just do it as a part-time gig for fun. Radical. Yeah, but cool experiences, man. Like you got to go to, there's cool videos on your Instagram where you were in Finland and like doing ice <laughs> driving. Mm-hmm. Right. So that was uh, what we call uh, in the Porsche world, we would call that peep. Um, 
it's also it's just basically driver evaluations to have a global standardized uh, score for amongst all the Porsche driving instructors and uh, generally what happens is that some of the centers will send out their in top instructors to get evaluated uh, so they can potentially do tours and do um, vehicle launches uh, for example the Taycan that was just released will have say 10 instructors from all around the world that do the track portion of that launch mm -hmm. so that's basically what that evaluation was for and I was lucky enough to get sent out by the uh, Experience Center in uh, Los Angeles to have a uh, have my score but honestly it was just a ton of fun <laughs> so how do you stack up <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell us, tell us. I did decent. Um, I still you haven't won. gotten to. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, the uh, reality is that you're competing against rally drivers and, you know, uh, indie car drivers. We had a few of the, uh, few guys from Blanc Pond and, and I, I stacked up well. I think uh, I'm, I still, the score is high enough to be a, um, essentially a, a, a manager, or chief instructor, or something like that. But, hmm. of course, there's a different ladder on that too. Did you notice them. how how quietly and humbly uh, Stagger mm. just dropped that nugget of like, oh, I I finished number one. I'm definitely the best, but I'm gonna make sure that you guys know just how tough the competition yeah. was first. And it's so funny because since I work at a dealership, there's there's a distinct possibility that I will be able to find out exactly where he ranks. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> well, hey, we all know how good he is, so. It's just about what their take on it was, which we may or may not agree with totally. But we're gl I'm glad that you had that cool s chance to have like a weird, almost like a Porsche Academy experience out in like James Bond style, like in a freaking <laughs> totally. in a freaking frozen lake. Right, it's it so was. Awesome. It's on the Arctic Circle. It was quite quite awesome. Radical. Yeah, that's that brings up to me the there's so many uh, opportunities out there. Just really quickly, I want to say like you talked about you having your foot in the door with GT Academy, just meeting people and then it snowballing into this uh, career, or this cool skill set of skills that you have now. And it's thanks to you most obviously, first of all, it's you like taking initiative, but obviously we all know that GT opens up a lot of awesome doors if you're really uh, aware of it. And that's what I would say to where, what I would want to say to a lot of people out there that feel like, Oh, I couldn't do that. Cause I'm just like, of you know i'm just a i'm not even a plus or blah 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 <laughs> but um a lot of those people that you're racing with in these lobbies yeah it's just a screen name but you have no idea like if you reach out and just ask you can e easily be friends with people in high places or people that are working on projects or you, right. you just never know totally right so the the cool thing is that the community i mean we're all car people right and whoever spends this many hours on this game is probably going to be a car person and we are all involved in some sort of you know whether it's autocross or you know going out to the casual track days or some some professional drivers like uh what's that gentleman from um south um god what's his name david oh, perel Bernal. Bernal. no no but uh, uh the guy that races in the emea what's his name david perel i think where he races yeah. In, oh yeah. yeah right so i mean there's such a range of things that we have in gran turismo it's just really what how you take advantage of it uh and you know, I think that's really the cool thing about this is such a great platform, and I think it's just not recognized how good of a platform it is yet. Totally, I would agree. I would agree there. Yeah, you, you, get, you get to meet some really insane, like-minded people. And going back, not even with the G, online GT world, but going back to like um, GT, like GT Planet, going in the, in the PlayStation Two days. You know, PlayStation Three. <laughs> I remember those. Um, dang, just so many cool people that I've gotten to meet that are. That grew up, that got inspired to get into cars, like way more, or racing way more because of GT. Mm -hmm. Right. So I never actually intended to do what I do now. It was just something that actually started from GT Academy. The, I was I was studying to be a mechanical engineer, uh, and then uh, GT Academy came along, and that completely changed my path. So yeah, it affects. Uh, I think it's it's hard to track how many lives I've been affected by this the game. Yeah. But I think it's significant. <laughs> yeah, man, I think it's uh, it's pretty awesome because we need more drivers, and you know, driving is becoming uh, more of a it's going kind of the way of the cowboy in a sense, right? It's kind of crazy. It it's is. insane, yeah. Uh, most cars are becoming automated, and you know, it's going to be like um, you know a thing of the past in the next Beast fifty back. years. Yeah, 
<laughs> like we're looking back at carbureted cars and like air cooled cars. I'm sure Tristan knows a little bit about this because he's got a 912, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we're looking at him like, nah, it's such a cool thing now. But 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it was kind of like a regular thing. So I think driving may be a thing of the past in the next 50 years. Most cars will be automated, so it's really unfortunate. But Yeah, only outlaws will have steering wheels. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, all off for life right here, bro. I'm gonna get driving for life. Where's, where's Richard? Sure. We need Richard in here. Outlaw quadrant over here. <laughs> oh, I know. Yes, dude. We're gonna have. That'll definitely happen. Yep. Yeah, but that... you guys are gonna get to see him in an Austria. Oh, we're gonna be on the same flight. You guys I, are gonna be in the I same. I can't wait for this. Luzite. I am so oh, pumped man. about that. Yeah. I'm going to get yeah, to the recording. airport early. I'm going to get all sauced and like be the ambassador to greet you guys. <laughs> yes. It's going to oh, have like a man. suit and tie. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't checked how many hours the flight actually is. So I don't want I, I, I to go off topic, but there may be a lot of alcohol consumption on that flight. There are saying. two digits. I won't say anything else. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't want to change it for me. Yeah, I don't want to change the subject too much, but yeah. That's <laughs> oh, going to be a no. good time. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I, I agree. It's going to be great to see you guys all together. And Tristan getting to meet the Europeans, is I'm looking forward to. So you definitely got to let us know how that stuff goes and, and how you're – because have you been to Europe yourself? Oh, well, yeah, you went to – You, you talking to Armin Arctic or Circle. talking to – Armin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I have been uh, – what well, part of Europe? I've. Uh, oh, I, yeah, you went – I originally moved from Greece to the oh, States. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I've been to France before, England with GT Academy. I've been to uh, Finland and yeah, some some places, but not all over. Do you have a favorite? Right. Uh, gosh, I'm not sure. Really, not yet. I, I would say I would have to maybe go into Germany. I, once once I'm done with Germany, I'll figure it out. I think <laughs> it's yeah. one of the must go to uh, must go places for me. I think. Yep, midnight on the autobahn. No you're matter right. what you're driving, you can be driving something with 60 horsepower. It doesn't matter. You don't have to take your foot off the throttle, and it's the most thrilling thing ever. Have you been, Tristan? I used to live in Germany, my friend. Oh, uh, no way. Okay. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. Really. I, uh, uh, I worked at a Roof between 2004 and 2005 selling parts to people who spoke English. I just picked up the phone and like, okay, I'll send you bumper and brakes and stuff. Wow. Um, made a lot of friends, had a lot of uh, very uh, privileged opportunities. Uh, went over 200 miles uh, an hour several times, and I I still have all my limbs. I'm happy to report, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 got to be uh, the the number one most recommended country I uh, uh, I give to anyone. It's it, not just from the autobahn, which is itself like a, an exceptional experience, but it's a clean country. Everyone's so nice. Um, the food is good. It's maybe down to personal taste, but like the, there is no better beer in the world than the beer from Germany. Uh, there's Sold. so many nice things to, <laughs> to see. Um, the topography is amazing. Uh, there's mountains, plateaus, plains, um, rivers, forests, all sorts of stuff. Uh, parks everywhere. They've maintained their forestry greatly. I could go on for hours. I don't want to take up like, you know, the entire cast just, uh, gushing about Germany, but you got to go. That's, uh, well... See, that's why I was waiting for Germany. <laughs> all I can hear, all I hear, is good stuff about Germany. So once I, once I, uh, I guess we're gonna land in Munich, so we get to kind of just see mm -hmm. Germany, but we don't really get to experience it. But no particular favorite places as of now, if that answers your question. It does. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on. Well, you get to pick from a few because you're gonna you're gonna get a little sampler of the world in the next few months. Going to Austria, then Tokyo after that, and then good old Monaco. Yeah, that's going back to to the coat. I'm excited for that. Japan and Monaco. I don't know how you guys feel, but that's that's the two uh, kind of the cherry on top totally. of all the world tours. I I use that word too much, but totally uh, is uh, appropriate for that. Especially uh, Tokyo, just uh, an exceptional like uh, technical masterpiece of a civilization, and then Monaco, the the tippy top of principalities. You know, what's what's the only thing above that? Maybe the Vatican? I don't know. Um, what I'm most concerned about is how they decide who's going to ride on the helicopter. Is it going to be rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> Wait, there's hmm? a helicopter ride? Yes, there is last year, a helicopter yeah. ride. Really? I don't know how they chose it because, you know, it's a small helicopter. You can't fit 70 people on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hoping it's going to be decided by arm wrestling, in which case I have a solid chance. 
Well, I've been lifting weights. So oh, why do you have to <laughs> ruin everything? <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing push-ups all uh, all summer, so I'm prepared. I think. No, I didn't know that. So that's pretty cool. Is that um, is that uh, generally for? Do they do any videos in there or any filming, or is it just for? For sure. Yeah, I saw some footage. They take you. I think it was like they shuttle. It was like a fancy shuttle from the airport or something. Yeah, from like they nice. land at the hotel. Yep. It was in the you know the the review video of um, twenty eighteen. I would I would pretend if I was you you know you you get the you get in the helicopter you get to your landing pattern and then you say oh I forgot my luggage can we go back real quick get another ride <laughs> oh darn <laughs> I forgot my toothbrush helicopter back <laughs> yep I'm actually gonna shave my neck this time so hopefully they'll think I look good enough <laughs> oh you look great no matter what I always shave my neck for the world go full tourism. Tom Hanks. <laughs> That's good. That's the you know a top tip from Gran Turismo's. Shave your neck, young men. <laughs> MBs. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so what about the Ford? Let's talk about that for a second. So yeah. you're gonna have to use the Ford GT. I mean, does that That's kind of right. soften your hopes for these events, or I think it's fast, it's fast in a straight line, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredibly fast on in a straight line, but. It, it, sort of falls on his face everywhere else right so <laughs> so it's uh i mean it's not great at anything besides the the top end of the car uh but it's not bad at anything either so mm -hmm. uh it there's it just comes down to the track and what kind of track we're going to be running spa right so uh on spa i think there's going to be I, I, we'll be competitive because it's got a fair amount mm -hmm. of straightaways and long sweeping corners mm -hmm. which the ford gt is good at Mm -hmm. uh, now, when it comes down to fuel consumption and tire wear, that's where we'll struggle. So we'll have to strategize that once we get there. But I think we'll have a good chance. I'm not too, I'm not, uh, I'm not too unhappy about the Ford GT. I prefer it, in fact, over the Mustang with mm -hmm. the new physics. So I, I'm actually looking forward to it. And it seems to be uh, uh, currently looking good on the wet surface as well. The rainy race in Red Bull. Right. Yeah. Mid engine. It's uh, it's got to be something on par with like the R8. Uh, it's from my testing. It's still behind the R8, but definitely ahead of most of the front front engine cars. So okay. it gives us a top five or top top five chance, I would say. Excellent. Yeah, and you never know. Like if there's a Bathurst round or Mount Panorama in the uh, future World Tours, it would do well there. See that 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 would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. But yeah, overall, it's I think it's it's it gives us a good chance. I'm glad um, I'm glad it's going to be two races. I, I don't know if we, we should be talking about this or is this okay? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it's on the website. Okay. It's all good. Okay, yeah, so appreciate it. Um, so it's going to be two races with uh, each race having three driver swaps. So all three drivers will get to race in both races, and um, I think that's 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 a cool dynamic that they're putting into it. I think that the whole team play comes into it a lot more. And I think that's going to be a lot more fun to watch as a spectator and actually to partake in as well as a competitor. So I'm, I'm quite excited about that. And the Ford GT seems to be a pretty strong uh, well, pretty strong car for the combinations that we got. So overall, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful for this next event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm hopeful for you guys too. You know, I'll be rooting for you too really hard, mm -hmm. watching closely. And you got on Ford, you have Adam Wilk with you, Armin. From Australia, right? Great dude. Got Amazing. Him in New York, he looks straight up like a World War II uh, action soldier. <laughs> yeah, uh, and he's he's, he's such a fast driver. I think he's actually underrated, and uh, uh, he the amount of practice he actually puts in uh, for each race, and he shows up and races against guys like Cody, uh, Makosi. I don't know. If, yeah, and and he actually keeps up and he potentially sometimes wins races i think it's Amazing. he's he's one of the best drivers i've ever met actually so awesome to have him as a teammate big time and then marco grasso from italy that guy Garassa 91 love that guy um just incredible speed i think uh i'm just super lucky to have these fast guys on my team um I, my, my only goal is to make sure i don't let them down <laughs> When you have uh, so many fast guys in your team, it's just kind of like, okay, i got to keep up with their pace. So right. I've been I, practicing a lot for that. I've shown you just uh, uh, yesterday at the top 16 round what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <Yeah. 
<laughs> that was an entertaining race, to say the least. I'll let Tristan explain what happened. <laughs> I almost ran into you, almost collected you. I'm really happy I didn't collect anyone else. Um, so long story short, uh, uh, Road Beef uh, had some incidents, and uh, after getting uh, uh, going into, I think it was turn five at Catalonia, the, the slower downhill left-hander, four wide with uh, uh, Dodge Lamb and... Uh, Zenit on my inside and Lester on the outside, and all of us making contact with each other. We exited the corner, heading into uh, you know the the fast uh, left uh, downhill braking of I think it's turn six or turn seven. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking about the incident behind me. I was just like preoccupied, like oh I I hope I didn't you know make anyone mad, and I kind of hit Lester wide when I got hit wide, and I just you know was thinking about the sportsmanship aspect rather than the driving the line aspect. And uh, I was I entered the braking zone unsighted, dropped the outside rear wheel, and that's all she wrote. That's all it took, and my race was over. <laughs> so at that point, I was directly in front of you, and all I was hearing is tire squeals, uh, just screaming tires, <laughs> screeching tires. And I'm and I'm wondering, did I cut him off at any point? Is he trying to avoid me right now? I'm looking at my radar, and I see a car pointing completely 90 degrees away from me. <laughs> 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 and um and i was i was i was totally thrown off by it and uh and i look back i see you going backwards i'm like gosh i hope i really hope i didn't cut him off i had to check the video to see what happened uh the replay mm-hmm. after the race but uh the for the next three corners i was just completely i'm like oh god i hope i didn't make this uh I, don't, I didn't make him spin out or anything so i felt horrible for the next co- three corners after that but it was quite the quite the uh uh I guess you could say the eventful corner over there. <laughs> I, I was just hoping that my livery looked good enough that it was it was cool looking on the replay for if that thing is going to be broadcasted. <laughs> it's like a bright blue car, hairy bow coming in sideways. <laughs> you know, I actually had to Google search what hairy bow is. Are you serious? <laughs> I'm sorry, man. We are no longer friends. <laughs> oh, I know what he's bringing to the. I know what he's bringing onto the flight. <laughs> So I'm like, what? What is that? So I, I looked it up and I found out. But yeah, that's that's cool. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people watching this will Google search it too. I hope. Yeah, a lot I of people waggling the their one. fingers. <laughs> All these people with sweet tooth, like Armin, how could you? <laughs> Some people will be really mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the bag of gummy bears is the go-to flight snack for me. Right, right. I, I hope you bring some with you. I've noticed that um, Ant has a lot of Haribo stuff now too. Mm-hmm. Spread the love. There's nothing that tastes like it, really. I mean, if you're a gummy connoisseur, this stuff is like in and out. It is addictive, totally. <laughs> I, who else is going to be in our flight? Daniel Lamb, mm-hmm. Dodge Lamb. <laughs> we got uh, Outlaw Quadrant. And Elise, Outlaw Quadrant. Uh, we, for Pug. we might have ants. Um, he's, he's not yet responded in the affirmative of whether or not he's flying out of SFO or Sacramento. Um, so we'll, we'll see, but, uh, he'll be welcomed either way. Yeah. Right. It's going to be quite a party all the way there. Oh, it's going to be so good. And what about back coming back? No idea. Uh, We're probably going to be on the same flight unless, uh, are you leaving Sunday or Monday? Um, Armin, if I recall correctly, I'm leaving Monday. Okay. So we're probably on the same flight. Right. So I think, uh, at least my itinerary is Munich to, SFO and then SFO to LAX. Mm-hmm. So I, I think they're bringing everybody back to SFO for all together, and then they disperse. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. I suppose. I mean, it could be Denver or something else, but you know, um, SFO to Munich is a very highly traveled route with a lot of airlines doing that direct route, so it's probably the cheapest option for them. You're right. Yep. So let me. I'm going to get us into a hot button issue, if y'all don't mind. I want your takes on the. Uh, this is kind of a controversy. This is uh, you know regarding the formula or not formula FIA um, manufacturer series. So the format was very competitive. Uh, it was five regions. Uh, very everyone. It was kind of shitty because you, a lot of the times you had to hope someone had a bad race in another region so you would qualify. Mm. And what's what's come up now lately is accusations being back thrown back and forth uh about how certain regions are helping each other get through and stuff like that which is you know the only people making a noise about it are those that feel like they didn't make it because of that but 
I personally think that since there's there's not even any uh, specific entry anywhere uh, really this you know you mean like wording in the rule book or something yeah there's nothing there's nothing explicitly you know preventing this sort of thing but like I, I my personal take on it is this is that if you don't have like if you, every every one of these regions has become like a, a really good community and we all take care of each other and people who are race well and and if you need a little bit of a leg up, sometimes it can come through in the form of, like, one, you know, if you're already qualified and you're helping another person out, I think it's fine. Yeah. I'll let it, Tristan, Tristan take. <laughs> yeah. It raises a whole lot of questions, uh, for sure, and it is a, a bit of a moral conundrum. And uh, with uh, ambiguous rule making, um, or at least the current rule book uh, standards, it's it, it is up to interpretation, and uh, if if the the rules were stricter and it simply stated like uh, no match fix match fixing allowed period you uh, you are to race flat out until the finish and if we find that you're lifting deliberately we'll exclude you like that would that would change everything and we wouldn't have this discussion but those words don't exist now uh, maybe those words will exist for next year who knows. But at least for this year, they don't exist, right? So uh, the way I look at it with that in mind is uh, one of two ways. Um, I can understand people getting frustrated about it, but um, I think, in my opinion, you can only justify your frustration if you're witnessing people doing it in a negative sort of way. Like you have one team, and I'm not trying to make any accusations. I'm only speaking in hypotheticals. Um, You have a team of, of drivers who want to see someone else get through uh, to uh, the live events and be the one of the top three scoring in the region. So um, they deliberately block someone else, you know, on track or, or block their qualifying or punt them off. Um, something negative, derogatory, damaging, that would definitely be looked down upon and I would personally shun and have shunned. Uh, but if it's, yeah. a, if it's a positive reinforcement where it's like, Okay, I'm already mathematically going to go in. Again, this is hypothetical. Um, and I have uh, uh, a friend or someone who has uh, been sportsmanlike with me who I would prefer to have at the live event with me because they're a good racer and I know that me and him or her can put on a good show. Then, uh, yeah, you know, I can, um, I can help them out and uh, pull aside and let them win or something like that. Now, um, it's effectively like team orders, right? And in Formula yeah. One and in other sports, team orders have been a contentious issue since the dawn of the sport's existence. And the the rules have flip-flopped back and forth, and um, it, it's a good topic for debate. And I don't think that there's a right answer because it's all circumstantial. Uh, and that's why the rule, uh, for example, in Formula One has changed every four years. Like in 2010, it wasn't allowed. And then in 2011, it was allowed. And it's been allowed since then. But it wasn't allowed for a time before that, ever since, like, what was it, Austria 2001 yeah. or 2002, when Barrichello yeah. pulled over at the A1 ring to let Schumacher pass. And it, it was only then looked down upon because of the crowd reaction. So, uh, you know, if it draws negative publicity, they won't allow it. If it draws positive publicity, it will allow it. Maybe maybe they've got to, they being the producers have to, and I'm sorry for going on so long about this, but um, I just want to ex- uh, 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 get across how complicated these kind of decisions can be because the, the makers of the game and the writers of the rules, ergo, need to um, consider uh, the publicity effects, the, the marketing effects, the potential ramifications that has on uh, the commerce and the success of their video game as well as their, their selling of advertisement space and uh, whether or not partners are going to be interested if match fixing is going on in a positive or negative way. So what, what do we have to work with? We have to work with the rule book. And the rule book as it sits right now, I believe, does not uh, explicitly um, el- eliminate or, or prevent these kind of things from happening. It, it's like case-by-case basis. Now, I know that like we all have a report function um, at the end of a race, you can report a player for being particularly rude or bargy or whatever. Um, and I have the feeling that a lot of these players who have helped other players have been reported. But what have we not heard? We've not heard of consequences, at least not yet. So, so I would be led to believe that perhaps the producers and the rule makers are aware of what's going on and are currently okay with the way things are going. So uh, let's see if things change for next year. 
but for this here, at least if it's if it's kind of just using the rules and maybe pushing the limit of the rules, I mean that's that's sort of what racing's about. Not that I necessarily condone it completely, but um, I'm also a believer in uh, the book by Mark Donahue, The Unfair Advantage. It's like you've, you've got to look for the little holes in the rule book right. and exploit them if you so choose. If it benefits you or benefits the people that you want to have benefited, do it until the rules change. Because <laughs> if you're not the one writing yeah. the rules, you bend the rules. That's the whole point. Exactly. Do you, think, um, it. do you think it comes down to the fact that there's five regions and only three get selected? I think that's a big factor in this. For sure. Uh, people, Big time. Yeah. For sure. I so, mean, we've, we've all put in so much time to this. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I'll let you continue. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to uh, get across how I understand the frustration of the people who are on the the, the edge of being eliminated, uh, you know, in the last, like, ten rounds. And they look at the, the match fixing or the help that's been going on, and they frown upon it and... I totally get it. It's we've all dedicated uh, the better part of this year to get where we are, and if we're pushed aside because of events out of our hands, then uh, what else do we have but to feel hopeless? And I understand that and I respect that. But uh, what can I say? It's just the it's the way it goes, and and uh, you're going to turn another leaf next year, and the rules may be different next year, and you're going to try again, and you're going to uh, take this experience as a lesson to know. Uh, like how to counteract it, what can, what can you do to try and prevent it, um, what kind of reporting can you do, what kind of driving can you do, what kind of planning you can do differently. Um, you can always adapt. You're all going to have a chance to adapt. If you haven't made it to these live events, um, you're going to be able to do it next year under, under uh, circumstances you're familiar with and circumstances you're going to uh, be better prepared to exploit. So uh, if, if, you're, if you're upset now, don't worry about it too much. <laughs> Um, as much as uh, it hurts to have the opportunity taken away from you in some ways, um, other opportunities are being now presented to you, if that's any consolation. I agree with you 100%. Uh, I, I, think, I think the way things have been presented as, uh, as the rules, uh, there's definitely some ways to exploit them, unfortunately. Uh, but there's no real consequences for these exploits, which is you know, uh, allowing a person to win or not passing on the track. And these are things that have happened in real life as well. So really hard to, uh, really hard to control. I think it's extremely situational. I think at the beginning of the year, nobody would allow a, an easy pass. Exactly. Yeah, Right. definitely not. But as the season comes to a, an end, there's going to be a lot of this happening as people are scrambling for points. So again, extremely, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's hard to regulate against, and it's hard to really uh, yeah. give a proper kind of like, oh, well, are you going to ban the person for allowing an easy pass? Are you going to how, how do you right. know it's an easy pass? What if you purposely spin out? It's really hard to monitor as well. So uh, I I really do wonder if how they're going to battle this. They've they've taken care of some. I think one instance of double accounting. I can't recall who it was exactly or what. But the thing is, uh, it, a lot of the time it's writing wrongs that have happened to a person in the past. Like some people like have had disconnections happen where they were like on pole or something or, you know, something not even as explicit as that. Maybe they had to miss a couple rounds for whatever reason. And it's just like sometimes they just need a, a little leg up. And if you can kind of accommodate that, it's not like you're setting out you, the the way that it's happened to me in the past and nation's cup and stuff last year. It was like, if I know that you're going to have a, like if we meet each other, like we'll have an agreement ahead of time where it's like, Oh, if we meet each other on track, we're, you know, let's not fight hard so we can get away from traffic. And then if you if this happens, then you, you'll take the win. If this happens, I'll take it kind of agreement. And it's, it's not that it's not a, it's not a grand prix every race it's uh they're shorter and they're in a series you know we, we do a lot of racing and so you take it circa you know race by race and you kind of make these gentleman agreements where it's like if it comes to pass that we're you know with on the same you know lap fighting for a win or whatever uh we'll play it out this way or that way we're just gentlemen <clears throat> about it and i i can see that some people that are more isolationists would be opposed to that and think it's or or people that are just like racing purists i can see them being opposed i hear you i get what you're trying to say i think 
uh, it, where where uh, a social ability almost comes into play as a factor of whether or not uh, uh, those who witness the the help, let's say, is condensed into one word, uh, being doled out um, and how they react to it, um, they might they might see that as something as uh, like an impossibility or an extremely difficult thing for them to do to try and reach out and establish a relationship with someone who might be uh, a competitor and be like, hey, you know, like I, I see a way that both of us can get into this. Let's, uh, you know, here's my olive branch. Let's see if we can work together so that we both get to enjoy the, the fruits of our labor rather than just one of us. Um, that that's, that can be very difficult. Uh, I, I consider myself quite... Uh, introspective, antisocial, uh, what is it, uh, introvert, there we go, the word I'm looking for, where um, being social uh, uh, takes energy to do, and I need to be my myself to recharge. It's it's like uh, when, when you're uh, going through life like that, you view every interaction as uh, like having a cost, a cost to your mental bandwidth. And uh, if, if you're not out there and about and hanging out with people very much, uh, that sort of a possible scenario where you need to extend the olive branch uh, to try and um, guarantee your uh, attendance to a prize event uh, is it looks like a very tall order. So uh, what is what is an easier reaction? And I don't mean this insultingly, but but fairly, uh, frustration. Frustration is the easier reaction. Um, I get that. Uh, everyone's different, and uh, I'm not saying it's any. Uh, easier or more difficult for other people to establish that kind of relationship, but uh, such is life, right? It's it's all circumstantial. Yeah, it's a community, well, firstly, I think, and they are the the designers of the game are smart enough to realize when they were whipping up these rules, they they had to uh, anticipate it, whether it was whether it was very conscious or not. They they had to kind of see something like this coming where. People were, were making friendships. They were gonna help each other out, even if they're not on the same, you know. Especially if they're not on the same manufacturer, because I'm sure on the same one, it's gonna, it's a little trickier. But yeah, I think I think it's fine, and, and I'm thinking anything great is gonna come of it. People can make all the hoopla they want on Twitter and point out different things, but the, the, the bottom line is every region was doing it some more. Uh, transparently than others so that's all yeah yeah but okay so we can end it by talking about the kind of what we want from you know having season well what would you call it just 20 yeah the 2019 season is behind us for fia and uh having that in the rear view mirror uh i'd like to talk to you too about what you'd like to see for the future, for next season, we already have the news that the next off season is starting in November. I believe that's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then going from there, who knows when the official season might start? I mean, last this year we thought it was going to start later than it did. So maybe next year, season starts in January. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. So well, Armin. We'll Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Tristan. Yeah. Maybe we'll have a live no, no, event no. in uh, February if um, if we're going to have an off-season in November. That might be the decider of who gets to go. Right. Yeah, we did have Paris in March, so we'll see. And they said there's going to be more uh, tour stops next year, so hopefully that works out. I, so yeah, I'll start with that. Where, where, What part of the world would you want the, a world tour stop to go, Armin? Uh Gosh, these, I mean, they do a great job by choosing some, some of the most iconic places all around the world, so... I wouldn't mind seeing uh, something like Russia, you know, Ooh, that's true. Yeah, um, so, uh, somewhere in South America, like Brazil would be really cool. Agreed, for sure. Um, heck, even coming out to the West Coast, somewhere in uh, oh, California, yeah. I think that would be... Then they'd be yeah. in our backyard again, yeah. Right. So, I think these are, these would all would be cool, but... Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, if there's more of them, I mean, you can always fit more... Uh, even Australia, I think that would be awesome, but I don't know how much of a question of logistics it is to get people from certain places to other places. And Oh, yeah. Just, as long as we're not trying to too. get people into North Korea, I think <laughs> they can figure <laughs> ways out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Imagine yeah. if they do North Korea and we, and, we're the, we're, and we become the reason for peace in... <laughs> Grand <Korea>. Turismo. <laughs> <laughs> 
ambassadors for peace. We can take the title from Fernando Alonso. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I forgot about that. Hilarious. But uh, I, go ahead. Logistically, the the uh, rigs, those things are heavy. Oh and yeah, huge, right. That's probably like the most difficult thing to truck around. That and like all the video equipment. Um, and uh, as far as people and staff, it's like just buy flights, just get hotels, Correct. you know, and get someone like Cafe Press to whip up or Puma to, to whip up your uniforms and you're all set. Um, but yeah, totally. South America needs an event. I think uh, South Africa could use an event. Australia could use an event. And yeah, something like Russia, Eastern Europe, maybe even like Turkey or, or who knows. Let's go to Iran. Dude, I've always wanted to see Tehran. That would be <laughs> wicked awesome. And I'm not even joking. Like That is a beautiful country. Here's an idea. How about and cause don't worry about it you know you do not have to pay me for this idea what you do is every country every continent or not country sorry that's a lot of countries but <laughs> every continent will have its own set of rigs why not Ooh. Ooh. change my view no but um <laughs> the idea being that maybe if you know and the rigs wouldn't have to be left there unused you can ship them out for cool little events you know every continent has like a pax gamescom kind of thing Ship it out, you know, pay some college kid to make <laughs> the rig, you know, handle the rigs a little bit and then have Thrustmaster bring a few hundred of their TGTs to make sure they they can have uh, working ones available in each place. And Same. I think it'll be good. Yep. I was thinking out of the box right there. <laughs> But yeah, <clears throat> that's a uh, world tour stuff. I mean, I'm I'm just excited for next year for pe- more people to get more chances to go out to different places in the world. Like I was talking to some staff in New York, and there were you know there were there were like they were just super surprised. At, I mean, it was kind of a snobby thing. I won't mention who said this, and it's nothing bad against them, but they had Ooh. encountered this where they they talked to a person that hasn't left their country. I've talked to people in the U.S. have never left their city. Yeah. Right. <laughs> There's a, they're all over the place. But in Europe, that's like a huge, they're like, I can't believe you've never, that's like them saying like, uh, that's like them hearing a person's never had, you know. Left a state. Yeah, yeah. It's like I in mean, Europe, yeah, everyone has passports, but not in, in the U.S. Yeah. USA is a big effing place. You know, California from Eureka to uh, San Diego is like going from Denmark to Spain. And that's like crossing, that, you're, you're crossing like six countries to, to mm-hmm. get where you need to go. Um, with six different languages or more. Um, I can understand why they would have that reaction. Uh, and with the United States, it's like we got like the crazy, ridiculous overstock grocery stores and the Costco and the, the Amazon deliver everything to you uh, sort of services. You have no reason to leave your house. And if you do, you're just going to drive through to get some in and out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Boom. 100%. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Armin, and, anything else there? Well, I was going to say, um, uh, all of us are competitors here, and all of us try to make all the world tours as, as much as, as much as we can. But, I mean, some of us have jobs as well. So I oh, wonder yeah. how, so I really wonder how having more of these world tours would affect the competitors. Very interesting. Yeah, point. That, that would probably affect things greatly because then you'd have more people. Even this year, uh, there are a few competitors that were having to be more picky and choosy or like where they had the chance to go to Austria or whatever. And then they, they had to turn it down because they were like, yeah, I only have so many vacation days. So if I go to Austria <laughs> and this place, I won't be able to go to world final. So obviously I want to go to world final. So I'm going to have to give you a, a negative on the trip to the Alps, unfortunately. Right. So I've had to actually adjust my, adjust my days for this. So I had to take days off from work, some unpaid, to be able to make the world tours. Uh, but it, it, I mean, if there's any more of them, I think it be, might be a little bit harder to uh, get consistent. You know, all the competitors to go out there consistently. Mm-hmm. I think it's hard yeah. enough as it is having like what four of them and mm-hmm. or three of them in, in within three four months. Yeah. Yeah, the staff was like, see, I uh, talking to the staff. They had this look on their eyes like they were about to climb a mountain. Like, yep, uh, this is the schedule, and we ended in November. So, Let me rephrase so this for you guys. We are burdened with an abundance <laughs> of live events to attend. 
first world problems. That is like a unique <laughs> statement that has never been said before. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, look at it from the other side as well. Um, oh, yeah. How fortunate are we to have this problem? Right. There's no there's no question about that. Well, I mean, uh, also, you do have to earn that position. So you do have to, you know, spend time practicing. But we are lucky to do some of the things Very that we do. So. I mean, I would probably never uh, go to Salzburg willingly. I mean, it's like, okay, well, it's an expensive tour, especially going, going to Hangar 7. Come on, like that's – that's one of the things that a lot of people will get to do maybe once in their life. Well, so, let me promise you this. Whatever you're paid per hour and the days you're going to miss, I'm going to make up for on a bar tab feeding you <laughs> alcohol. So I'm prepare <laughs> prepare your liver, my friend. <laughs> I've been pre- you trust me. I'm I'm ready. Let's do this, Tristan. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right. So the next podcast, uh, we will attempt to talk. <laughs> We'll, we'll see how far we get with complete sentences, and uh, uh, we'll check in live with Armin's condition. Uh, as, uh, stay tuned, and uh, hope you'll join us. Plane cast. <laughs> this is gonna yes. be on uh, during the on the plane. We're, well, maybe uh, we'll we'll at least get snippets. Um, I'm gonna have you know just like the little clip-on microphone fucking thing, and uh, yeah, uh, we'll we'll get like at least some. Uh, quick takes if not uh, i'll do a cast with uh, uh outlaw who will have uh, a, a diversified opinion about all the things we talk about and actually probably have some enlightening things as well so um certainly i'll have a lot of material for you eddie so i hope your your uh, editing keys and, and fingers will be at the ready <laughs> i'll be ready i'm gonna have a lot of fun listening to them because when you edit a podcast you, you talked on it's like Oh, I already know what happened, but <laughs> it'll be fun to hear, to go through the conversation and pick out stuff. So yeah, yep, like best ofs and, and such, and just isolate all the swear words that comes out of Rope Beef's mouth, and just make like a quick like <laughs> sixty minute, you know, put it to Instagram and all sorts of social media of like, wow, I didn't know Rope Beef was such a potty mouth. Did this guy was he born as a sailor? Or like, I don't understand. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's hilarious. <laughs> Yes. Well, it's been really fun having you on here, Armin. It's uh, it feels supernatural. Uh, wait, it feels very natural to have you here. No, no the first, no, the first description. The first one totally accurate. works. Yes, it does. <laughs> this is an experience. Yes. But yeah, been well, thanks for having to me it on for a while, and super glad. Yeah, let's do it again, so we can talk about your experience in Austria afterwards oh, and so world good. finals, like prep and all that great stuff, man. Absolutely, man. And guys, seriously, thank you for having me on. This is awesome. I love picking your brains and I love hearing your opinions on everything. We don't get to do this often enough. So thanks for uh, bringing me on. Well, it's been a Likewise, pleasure. man. Yeah, thank you for coming, my man. Absolutely.